Thank you for coming this evening. Please turn to the second psalm, psalm number two, please, as we continue our study. We began Sunday morning in the book of Psalms. We've discussed Sunday the fact that the, the book of Psalms is a, uh, it's inspired poetry, 150 different poems that were used in Old Testament worship and important lessons for us as well. Many of them written by David, but not all of them. Various other inspired writers wrote many of them. Uh, and it's because it's poetry, it's different, a different kind of poetry though. It's uh, Hebrew Old Testament poetry. The emphasis is not as in our poetry on rhyming or on the rhythm. The emphasis is on the ideas and especially there's parallelism that we will see and a lot of symbolism as well that we need to be aware of. So we uh, discussed last time the first psalm in which the godly man and the blessings he receives as a result of being godly are compared to the troubles that one have if they're not godly. And the righteous man doesn't follow up the teaching, the concept of counsel of those who are ungodly. And as a result, he's blessed and he's fruitful, but the ungodly man is like chaff driven away. And he's not going to stand in the judgment. And God knows the way to judge properly between the ungodly and the godly. And that's where we were at the end of our study last time, at the end of the first psalm. But tonight then for the second psalm. Questions or discussion anybody has on Psalm number one or our introductory material last time? Okay, so tonight then, we're going into the second Psalm. Let's go ahead and read it. And again, remember, it's com most likely completely unrelated to the first Psalm. It's just like the songs in our songbook. Each one stands in a, uh, on its own right without connection to the ones before or after. So the second Psalm, and who'd like to read Psalm chapter two for us, please? Frank, please. Why do, the, <clears throat> why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king o my holy, on my holy hill of, of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with tr trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you, you perish in the way. When, it, when his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Okay. So it starts out discussing a plot. In the first three verses, the psalm kind of uh, is broken up, and might say, are organized in sections of three verses each, at least there are in our translations. The first three verses describe a plot. And so I ask you question number one, what is the plot? Who's involved and who are they plotting against and so on? What's the plot described in those first three verses? Question number one, Karen. Uh, the kings of the earth and the rulers are plotting, um, taking counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Okay, so we have a plot from rulers and the people uh, they set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay. Um, other comments on what the plot is? Susie. Well, is there dual meaning? Um, since um, I was trying to 
trying to think if this was said David wrote it, but uh, possibly a possibly a plot against David as the anointed king of Israel, and um, uh, and God say no that he's he's my anointed, and uh, and so he defeats David's enemies. Okay, I thought I saw some other hands. Other comments, uh, Terry. Um, I looked at, at, at it as if it was literally talking about the Lord and the kingdoms of the earth are um, trying to cast off the rule of God in the world. Okay, so the Lord, you're talking about God then. Okay. All right, so uh, first of all, let's notice verse 3, uh, which I don't think we've specifically been mentioned that. Their plot is to break the bonds and pieces and cast away their courts from us. In other words, it's a rebellion. Uh, whoever these people are are rebelling against the Lord and his anointed. Um, so let's discuss some of the terms and some of the background to help us understand it better. First of all, the anointed refers to what? What is the significance of the term anointed in verse 2? What is the anointed? What's it mean? What's it refer to? Rick? God's chosen. Okay. God's chosen and it, uh, the uh, anointed ruler, the king. The New Testament word for it is the Messiah. Okay. So the Old Testament is anointed. The New Testament is the Messiah. Okay. So we have the anointed referring to the... But however, however, the Old Testament uses the word anointed to refer to the king as well. The Old Testament king was called the anointed. Christ is the anointed ruler in the New Testament, so he's the Messiah. It's the same term, and it's used for both. Okay? Well, let's look a little bit further, and maybe we'll get some better idea of what we're talking about. I ask you question number two. Where is this quoted in the New Testament? How is it used there? So where do we go in the New Testament to learn about this? Steve. In Acts chapter 4, 25 and 26. Okay, let's all turn there, please. Acts chapter 4, verse 25, and the following Four verses. Who but the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, as Susie, I think, mentioned, that tells us who wrote this psalm. The psalm itself does not say, but uh, by inspiration, the uh, people here in the New Testament, the book of Acts, say who it is. And by the way, let's get a little bit of the background here of Acts chapter 4. What has happened that has brought them to the point of quoting this psalm? What are the things in the context that have happened before this? Rick? Now over in verse 1 it says, As they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So, okay. Uh, rulers were coming against them, and they also down in uh, verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what's happened is, the, uh, in the context, Peter and John in chapter 3 had healed the lame man at the gate of the temple, and the rulers arrested them for it, commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. So in chapter 4, verse 23, having been set free from the rulers, Peter and John go to, it says, their own company, in other words, the other Christians. And they tell them what's happened. And so then they quote this passage from Psalms in the, uh, a prayer to God. And they're discussing why an explanation for what's happened. The nation's raids, the people plot vain things, and so on. And take their stand against the rulers, and so on. So then they explain it to us in verse 27. What's their explanation for the application of that verse in verse 27? Terry. The city... And the rulers have gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. Okay. So their explanation for it is, 
that people are op opposing the, uh, the servant Jesus whom you anointed. Now who is it that's opposing them? Opposing him? Who is it? Herod, Pontius Pilate, the rulers. Okay. Herod, Pilate, and the Gentiles. The Romans. Now if you look at the, at the quotation that they quote, it says the nations rage. Remember the word nations means Gentiles. So the Gentiles are fulfilled in this passage with the Romans. Uh, P uh, Pilate and the Romans and so on with the Gentiles and Romans. And then it says the people plot vain things. The people are the I people of Israel. The Jews. So their explanation of it is the uh, Herod, Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel gathered together. And what, was the, what did they do as a result of their gathering together? Verse 28. Susie. To do what they had determined to do, which was oppose and stop, and if necessary, kill Jesus. Okay. And so we have an explanation there of an application of the passage. That the fulfillment of the passage, at least the fulfillment used in Acts 4, is that the rulers of the Gentiles take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ, the Messiah, uh, the, the nations, the Gentiles, and the, the Jewish people plotting against God to do what they want. Break the bonds, don't do what God says, but do what they want, and in this case, they, they kill Christ in order to accomplish it. And so that's the explanation in Acts chapter 4. Okay? Questions or comments in Acts 4 and how it explains it? I know that Susie's point from earlier before is whether or not that's the only application as we look back at Psalm 2 of what it says. Or some people believe that many of these uh, psalms, especially the ones spoken by David, sometimes are talking about something in his life which is a type or a symbol of something that happens to Christ. We want to see that a lot. And I don't know in many cases where we'll be able to know for sure whether or not there, there's that type and symbolism or whether it's just talking about the Messiah. One thing for sure is this psalm is about as much as any as we see most of it could easily apply to Jesus. Whether or not any of it applies to David, I'm not sure I can say. But almost everything we're going to see would have an application in, to Christ. And sometimes it's not all that obvious. To me that's fairly obvious, at least in this case. And we have a New Testament passage that says so. That it has an application to Jesus in Acts chapter 4. Okay? Other comments on Acts 4 and the application that they make of it in that passage. Okay. Uh, let's see where else we are now. Okay. One interesting comment is that this psalm that we're reading in Psalm 2 is the most frequently cited of the psalms in the New Testament. More New Testament references to this psalm than any other psalm that we will study. Okay. So, so I'll ask you then uh, question number three or four. Well, well that's part of question three. What are some ways people today rebel against Christ? Against God and his anointed? Well, that's part of question number three. What are some ways that this happened? We see how it applied in the case in Acts 4 that killed Jesus. How do some people uh, rebel today against him, Steve? They reject his teaching. Okay, rejecting his teaching. They may not physically kill him, but when they disobey him, they're showing a rejection of his teaching. Okay, other examples, other ways that people today rebel, Terry? Well, in the denominational world, uh, especially with, among the Catholics, they displace him as the head of the church and put a man in his place. Okay, and not just Catholics with a, a man as the head, but denominations in general have man-made laws. They have men who get together and meet and make their laws. And so almost all the denominations have their laws which they claim to follow. But in a, they claim to follow the Bible and Jesus, but they also have their other laws which is, uh, were not made by Jesus. Okay? Other examples of people who re, uh, are rejecting Jesus and his teaching. Uh, Steve, another example? But denying his existence. 
Okay, some just flat out deny the existence of God, don't they? Or they deny that Jesus was who he claims to be. That he was uh, either a fraud or they say he was just a man, not really God in the flesh, okay? Other examples of rejection of Jesus today? Uh, Frank? Well, there's all forms of uh, blasphemy against uh, God and his word and the, and the Savior. Okay, so there's people just speak against it. And in, the, in our society, we see so much disrespect for God, for Jesus. To some people, the names of God are just a curse word. Uh, and other forms of just, just, just disrespect for God's teachings about the family, about the church, about worship, about salvation, uh, and about more moral issues of all kinds. And so, while this uh, Acts 4 applies specifically to them killing Jesus, when anybody disobeys and rebels against God, they have the same kind of problem. So we shouldn't be surprised to see the kind of uh, opposition to Christ today when we see here plainly said that it would happen, that people would rebel against Jesus and the Lord. Uh, Rick? I look at our political world and our rulers that make laws that go completely against the Bible, completely against God's scriptures. And uh, they just expect us to accept it. And you notice that it's not just the people, but the rulers that are specifically mentioned here. And many times it is rulers who, for whatever reason, uh, oppose gospel and the teaching of the gospel. Okay? In the discussion on the, the first three verses then, anybody? All right, so let's look now what happens. What is God's reaction in verse 4? Question number 4. How does God respond to this rebellion? He laughs at them and, and holds them in the duration. Okay. They, he laughs at them. They think they're going to rebel against him, and he's just laughing at them. Now, is he laughing because he thinks it's funny? Why is he laughing at them? Susie? Because what they're doing is uh, futile. It's folly. Okay. He holds them in derision because what they're doing is vain, okay? They're not going to defeat him. They're not going to defeat his purpose. And if you apply it to them when they killed Jesus, obviously he wasn't laughing in the sense that he thought it was humorous, but for them to think that they could defeat his purpose is foolish. Anybody who thinks they can defeat God's purpose is uh, silly, childish, okay? Other comments on what God is going to do in response? All right, how about verse 6? How is this? Uh, and in Acts chapter 4, in the last part of question number 4, explain this part too. What else happens according to verse 6? Terry. Well, they crucified him, but then God made, erased him and made him king. Okay. So, God made him king anyway. Why did the people kill Jesus? Well, verse 3, they didn't want him to rule. They were rejecting his authority. But because they killed him, what happened? Did they avoid his authority? Did that defeat his purpose? Rick? No, God gave him all the nations to rule over just like the first verse said. Okay. He's sitting there at the right hand side of God. Okay. As a result of the crucifixion, one thing that happened is he was went to heaven and was anointed king. He became king after he died. To, uh, Susie, you have a comment? Well, Acts 3 and verse 18 God knew and uh, foretold uh, that this would happen. So what they did only verified what God had said would happen. Okay. 
So the king was crowned despite the opposition. Now that's so what what they thought would defeat Jesus and his purpose was exactly what it took to accomplish Jesus' purpose. He had to die for our salvation. He had to die to go to the right hand of God and serve That was what God planned and purposed all along. So whereas they thought they were defeating him, they were doing the exact very thing that God had said all along and the thing that needed to be done to accomplish the purpose of God. Okay? Other comments on question number four and uh, verses four through six. All right, now, there are some passages that refer to, let's see a moment, okay, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead. Uh, any other comments? All right, let's look ahead then at verses, yeah, no, question number five. Just like the Jews thought that Jesus' purpose was defeated if they rejected him, there are people today who think that because the Jews rejected Jesus, he couldn't accomplish his purpose. He came to become a king, to establish his kingdom, they say, but he couldn't do it because the Jews rejected him and killed him. Now, if, they, if they'd accepted him, he would have been their king, but they'd rejected him, so he couldn't become king, so he has to wait until he comes back again to establish his kingdom. Meanwhile, he's, we have the church. That's the premillennial idea. Question number five. What does this passage have to do with that concept? How can you use this passage to relate to that concept? Steve. In Matthew 21, 40, verse 42, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is quoting Psalm 18, 22 and 23 in this passage. Okay. So that passage confirms what we're seeing in this passage, that the fact that they rejected Jesus didn't stop him didn't stop God from anointing him as king at his right hand. Didn't prevent Jesus from becoming king. It was exactly what needed to happen for him to become king. So the people today who think Jesus did not become king because he was rejected are making the same very mistake that the people, the Jews did in the first century. God says, here they say, we're going to reject him. We're going to break his bonds and cast away his cords. And God's just sitting up there in heaven laughing at him. And he's going to verse... Six, yet I have set my king on my holy hill. I'm going to do it anyway. You can't stop God from doing what he wants to do. You can't stop his plans. And in fact, in this case, it was exactly what he had planned all along. Okay? So, anybody who today who says that Jesus came to establish a kingdom and couldn't do it, is saying that God's weak. God doesn't have the power to do what he wants. And God just laughs about that and says he's going to do it anyway. You can't stop God. Yet that's the same mistake that premillennial folks make that was made in the first century. Other comments on question number five, Terry. Well, also when you go to the book of Acts, um, chapter four, um, and verse um, 28, that this was done to do whatever your hand and your plan has predestined to take place. Right, that's the application that they made there in Acts four as they quoted this passage, was that they just did what God planned all along. Okay, any other comments through verse 6 and question number 5? All right, now we come to question, uh, verse 7 and question number 6. So the Lord made uh, the anointed one king anyway, and then he declares a decree. What does God say about uh, say in verse 7, last part of verse 7. What is God's decree in verse 7? Carrie. Uh, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay, now, I don't know about you, but I have uh, at times struggled with that. But that very passage is quoted and referred to several places in the New Testament. Uh, last part of question six. Where's the quote in the New Testament? Where's the New Testament referred to this statement by God in verse seven? Where's that in the New Testament? Neil. 
X1333. Okay, you want to read fourth, please? Uh, this he has fulfilled to us, uh, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, uh, You are my son, today I begotten you. Notice the connection there. What event does that passage quote or refer to tying this uh, verse 7 to in the New Testament? What event does he tie it to? Terry. The resurrection. The resurrection. It's fulfilled in the resurrection. That God said, Thou art my son, uh, this day I have begotten you. Okay. So I ask you some questions then. Uh, well, first of all, let's uh, yeah, let's go ahead and look at first question number seven a little bit. Is this saying that Jehovah's Witnesses will use verses like this and say, see, Jesus was begotten. That means he's not eternal. He was born sometime, and, uh, but he came into existence. The father brought him into existence. He begot him like a father begets a son physically. So if the father begot Jesus, then Jesus must have a beginning. He can't be eternal. Okay. Now we'll discuss what the word begotten means, but first of all, I ask you, what passages show that in fact Jesus is eternal? Do you have some scriptures that show Jesus is eternal? Question number seven. Susie. Well, in addition to the passages that you listed in John 1, 1 through 3, um, saying that he was from the, he was the word and was from the beginning, was with God and made all things, but also in Colossians 1, 15 through 21, let me read that. Let me read that. Sure. Well, you don't have to read the whole thing, but enough to get the point. Okay. Okay, he, referring to Jesus, is made in the image of the uh, invisible God, firstborn over creation, for by him all things were created, um, and all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Okay, so just that it, part of it is enough to show Jesus, if he created all things, then he didn't have a beginning. How could he have created all things if he had it? Uh, he would. Uh, if he created everything, then he doesn't have a beginning. He's eternal, just like the Father, John chapter one, and also it says that all things were made uh, through him and so forth for him. So he is eternal, like the Father is eternal. John chapter one. Any other passages showing that Jesus is eternal? Do we have any others? Terry. First, first John one first. Verse that which was from the beginning. Okay, same concept as John chapter one. Then you have passages like John chapter eight and verse fifty-eight, where Jesus said before Abraham was, "I am," implying his eternal eternal existence, like the Father, and so on. Matthew five verse two, when it talks about him being born in Bethlehem, it was says he was from eternity. Okay, so other passages that show that. So anybody who thinks that Jesus was a created being. Not only is mistaken about his the fact that he's had a beginning, not eternal, but they're mistaken about his deity. God is eternal. Jesus is deity. And therefore he is eternal. Okay, so then whatever this begotten means, uh, question number eight, whatever it means, it isn't saying that the Father brought him into existence or caused him to begin. He is eternal like the Father is. So the question then is, what does it mean that he's begotten? So I ask you some other passages. It talks about the Father having begotten Jesus, question number eight. So you have some other passages that show that he's begotten, or the firstborn, uh, a similar expression. Other passages, anybody has on that? Question number eight. Steve. In Hebrews chapter one, Verse 5 and 6. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says that all the angels of God worship him. Okay. Did you notice there that Psalms 2 and verse 7 was quoted in that passage? Uh, and refers, and then other passages as well, uh, other references, that what is said about Jesus is not said about angels. God never says about angels, thou art my son, they have begotten thee. Uh, but he just said that about Jesus. Okay? Other passages. Uh, Susie. Oh, well, you're here. I've got thoughts ahead. Derek. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, where this is quoted again in starting in verse 33 but when you go down to verse 34 after it says you are my son today I have begotten you as and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead it's a connection to the fact that it was at the resurrection that he claimed him as his son okay other comments all right now I don't want to confuse the issue but what was bothered me in the past was, before the resurrection, God calls him his son. It doesn't start at the resurrection. He calls him his son, for example, when he's baptized. This is my beloved son, and I'm well pleased. Transfiguration, same thing. So he was God's son before the resurrection, yet there's some sense, apparently, in which at the resurrection, uh, God, in some other sense, or some special sense, used him as his son that he's begotten. So first of all, Let's discuss that word. Uh, Susie, have a comment? Let's, get, let's discuss that word begotten. If it doesn't mean that he brought him into existence like a father bringing an, an earthly son into, be, into existence, what is the significance of that word begotten then? Comments on what the word means, Steve? Unique, one of a kind. All right, special. Okay, other comments? Frank. Uh, Revelation. Uh, 1 verse 5 says from, Je from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood so he was the firstborn from the dead okay that's a, I think I missed that point but all right so in a sense he was begotten from the dead uh, Debbie you have a comment well, I look at it as being a relationship. God is claiming him before and after, but it's a relationship that God has with him. A father has a very special relationship, a unique relationship, back to Steve's word, a unique relationship with his son. But remember, we're talking symbolism. Psalms is a book of symbols. So it's not saying this is literal or physical. There's symbols, symbolism here that just as a father and his son have a special relationship because the father begot the son, so God the Father has a very special relationship with Jesus as his son, but it's expressed with this expression, begotten. This word son, for example, is used over and over again in Scripture for things that are not a physical relationship of a father and his son at all but simply talking about similarity of character or a close relationship, a relationship of love and care and so forth. Uh, and we saw that we've seen that a number of times and uh, in that sense we are children of God uh, as Christians because we've been born again, not from our physical birth. And other passages, uh, uh, people that are evil are thought of as told us the son of the devil. So that word is used all kinds of different ways. So it's a highly symbolic way, especially here in the Psalms. Same thing with the term begotten. It does, it's not talking about bringing into existence. It's talking about a relationship. But this special relationship apparently began when Christ arose from the dead. Now, Susie, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, yeah. Um, this, in, in addition to what Debbie said of, of it being a unique position specific to relationship, the word is used, uh, the same word is used to describe Isaac in Hebrews eleven seventeen, as Abraham's only begotten son. Well, we know that he wasn't his only son, but he was the only son by Sarah and the only son of the covenant. Um, so he had a, a unique um, purpose in relationship. Okay. Other comments? 
Now, there's another way that's special that I want us to notice. Look in 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. But this is the promise that God made to David about David's descendants who would be kings according to his dynasty after him. Fulfilled ultimately in Jesus. Verse 13, he talks about his descendant would build a house for his name and establish the throne, God will establish the throne of his kingdom. But notice verse 14, talking about the descendants, this king. Verse 14, who'd like to read 2 Samuel 7, verse 14 for me, please? 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, who'd like to read that? Susie. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So the descendants of David that would serve as kings on his throne, how does God describe his relationship to them? He says he will be a son and I'll be his father. Now, this kind of expression, again, it's used many times. God used the expression that Israel was his son, the nation was his son. So, different ways the word is used emphasizing special aspects of relationships. It appears to me that the descendants of David as king would have a special relationship with God the Father as a father-son relationship ultimately fulfilled in Jesus but when did Jesus become king? Debbie? After the resurrection. When he arose from the dead. Which fits all this that we've been talking about then. When he arose from the dead, then he became not a, sense, a son in the sense of, that of having been physically begotten, and not a son in the first sense. He'd already been a son in one sense, but as being the king at God's right hand. In fulfillment of these prophecies, that began when he arose from the dead. Okay? So that seems to me to fit together all these passages we've been talking about, so that God is, uh, Jesus is now on the throne of David, at God's right hand, declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 and verse 4. Uh, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. That is when he arose from the dead. Other comments? Does that, that help me? Does that help you? Other comments on that? Okay. Ready to move on? All right, so then he says, what's he going to do for him? He sees his son. He's running as a king now. We're talking about this coronation as king. What's God going to do for him then in verses 8 and 9? Terry. He will make Jesus the king who will break and destroy the rebellion and give him all authority in heaven and earth. All right, all authority in heaven and earth. He will overcome the rebellion. Those who rebel against him, back in verse 3, he's going to be the victor. This is describing, he's the king, he's the victor, he's the ruler. Okay? Can you think of other passages that discuss that? I'm not sure where we are on the questions. Uh, yeah, question number 9. What other passages show that Jesus is going to be the victor over those who rebel against him? Well, what's the theme of the book of Revelation? Jesus is going to be the victor, right? He's going to win. Those who rebel against Jesus are going to lose, and he's going to be the victor. The Satan's, the, Satan's been defeated already. Those who follow him are the losers. Christ is the conqueror. He's the winner. And he's going to, as in, again, highly symbolic, break them with a rod of iron, dash them with a, like a potter's vessel. People who think they can rebel against God are fooling nobody but themselves. God is going to defeat them. Jesus is going to have the power over them. And in the end, he's going to have the power over all the nations of the earth. Okay? Other comments through verse 9. Come on. In Revelations 12:5, it says, And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God to his throne. Okay, and this is also quoted in Revelation 2, verse 27. 
quotes this passage as we apply to Jesus in Revelation 2, verse 27. Okay, and then we have the prophecy of Daniel seeing the vision of the, the statue of the, symbolizing the four nations and God would set up his kingdom in the Roman Empire that would break in pieces all the others and so on. So all this is just describing the victory of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? So no matter what they oppose him, he's going to make him king. And the, uh, he, God, the king is going to be the victor. And what's going to, what lesson should we learn then, verses 10 through 12? The lesson for those kings, the lesson for all of us, is what? What's the application, verses 10 through 12? Frank. They should embrace discipline and uh, receive instruction. Okay, specifically, instruction from the king. What's the significance of kissing the king? He says, kiss the son. Susie? To honor and submit. Okay, honor and submit. Acknowledge him who he is. Submit to him, bow before him. And so rather than rebel against him, rather than reject him, accept his instruction, verse... 10, serve him with fear, verse 11, and kiss him. Uh, that is, accept him for his authority that he is. Uh, otherwise, then the, the wrath will become, come upon you. The last part of verse 12. Okay, other comments, discussion to verse 12. Anything, anything else I'd say, Terry? Well, it, this discussion of all of the nations coming against him and then and the end him ruling against all the nations helps pull out that thought that it's not just going to be the kingdom of Israel. It's not just that kingdom that God has prepared all this for. It's for the whole world. Whereas David and his immediate descendants were rulers over Israel, this king will rule the whole world. It's, a, it's not a physical nation anymore. It's all people of all nations should submit to him. And at the judgment, everybody will submit to him. Other comments? On, anything else on chapter on Psalm 2? Any other comments? All right, next time then we'll plan to go into Psalm 3 and 4. That's next assignment. Okay? Thank you.